What's up? Hey, how are you? You ready for tomorrow? You said you're testing tomorrow? Yeah, 8 a.m. Just got the confirmation from Prometrics. So, All right, cool. So what do you want to talk about in your 30 minutes? How are you feeling? What's your last practice um, score? I always feel like I'm never prepared, and I don't know what I don't know. So the question that I was thinking of, I, I didn't even know what to ask. So uh -huh. if you, honestly, if you just wanted to, to, to go over what you feel is the most important. Yeah, sure, sure. Exam, so let's, uh, let's poke around your brain housing group and see what's up there. Uh, okay. Now, listen, the first, the, the first thing, I usually don't do coaching calls or tutoring if I know it's the day before, because our first thing is the Hippocratic Oath. First, we got to do no harm, right? So, yeah. you know, you got to be in a, a psyche wise where you're going to be okay. All right. So that being said, if this becomes too tra traumatic for you, just say, hey, that's enough. I'm going <laughs> to go uh, study. Who is yeah. not a person? Who is not um, a person? Oh, that's such a good question. Do I have an answer set or do I have to just go off memory? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, you're in the tomorrow. Good news. You're going to have an answer set. Uh, right now, you don't. Remember minors, dead oh, yeah, minors. persons, and people that are legally yeah. incompetent. Okay. okay. What is the three prong test about being an investment advisor? How do I look at an uh, in, uh, uh, entity, an unnatural person, and say, if I'm the state administrator, you look like, you quack like, uh, an investment advisor, and therefore you're an investment advisor, and you're going to have to register. You're talking about three things that create the investment advisor? A, B, C. Yeah. A, B, C. Do you give investment advice? Do you tell people you're in the business of giving investment advice, and you want compensation? Now, you're either going to be federally covered or state covered. So, you know, state administrators, John, uh, we're not a big fan of the National Securities Market Improvement Act because the National Securities Market Improvement Act took power away from the state administrator. And it created basically two buckets of federally covered things. One bucket they created under NIMSMIA was federally covered investment advisors. And the other bucket they created was federally covered securities. So if we are an investment advisory firm and we are going to have to register, we're either going to register with the Fed or the states, never both, one or the other. So what would make you a federally covered investment advisor? I see some of the questions that that are, and I don't know why, I probably should have brought some of those uh, to the meeting today. Yeah. But some questions were saying like 100, over 100 million. 100 million plus, I, I get to choose. I get to choose. Okay, I don't know so if anybody John. Over I don't know if anybody who would be... choose not to be federally covered because it's, you know, yeah. freedom, you know, yeah, instead exactly. of having 50 states run around now, 110 federal. So mm -hmm. 100, you can choose 110 federally covered. How uh, about I, I lose assets under management? How much assets under management can I lose before I get kicked back to the state? Uh, you mean like 90? Well, yeah, there you go. 90 million. So remember not tomorrow, that'll all be in front of you. So mm -hmm. if I go, I'm going to register with the state, uh, we're going to file Form ADV Part 1 and Form ADV Part 2. There are some people who uh, give investment advice, but is incidental and therefore don't have to register. What yeah. would be uh, some of those folks? Um, teachers. Yeah, right on. Lawyers, accountants, teachers, engineers, right? Good way to remember it is late, yeah. late. Now, okay. uh, if you're federally covered, and you're an investment advisor of a federally covered advisor, do you have to register with the state? Now, be careful. This is really important tomorrow when you're reading the question. They ask me about an investment advisor rep of a federally covered investment advisor or an investment advisor rep of a state covered investment advisor. If you're an investment advisor rep of a federally covered investment advisor, all you have to do is register with the state in which you have a place of business, period, full stop. Oh, okay. Now, if you're an investment advisor of state covered, then all that other stuff comes into play about, you know, de minimis and all that kind of stuff. Now, all the registrations, all the registrations expire on December 31st, with one exception, the registration of a security. So registers, registrations of persons, firms, and individuals mm -hmm. is December 31st. Yeah. If we register a security with the state administrator, that's a year. So in other words, if we get to effect, we go effective in March, then we get to go all the way to next March in terms of our registration. Only one that is true of. Now, as we said, the other thing you want to be careful about is registration of broker dealers, because it's a little different. 
So investment advisors, are you going to register with the state or the SEC? Never both. How about broker dealers? There is no de minimis for a broker dealer. A broker dealer has one retail customer in the state. That broker dealer has to be registered, period, full stop. Doesn't matter what type of business they're doing. If they're in that state, they got to be registered to that state. Now, if you're an agent of the broker dealer, you're an agent of the broker dealer, you can't be registered in a state unless your broker dealer is. So, you know, if you're going to have a customer in a state, then you're going to have to get your broker dealer to be registered in that state as well. Now, uh, every once in a while, clients uh, say, hey, you know what, John, I've decided to move. And you're not registered in the state I'm moving to. So that means you're going to have to get your broker dealer registered. And then you're going to have to register. And how many days do you have to do that if you have somebody who moves? Um, is, is that one of the promptly or 30 days? Yeah, 30 days. 30 days. So there is some uh, uh, prompt, uh, you know, things like that that you're going to get on your thing tomorrow. Um do I have to uh, get registered to state that my uh, customer is visiting? No. My customer is on vacation in Arizona. I don't have to register that. Uh, unethical business practices. No selling no dividends. Don't do it, right? Yeah, no breakpoint sales. None of that stuff, right? No churning, no fictitious accounts. You know, don't lie, cheat, or steal. I think you should be pretty good on that. I mean, even yeah. I joke, if somebody doesn't have ethics, they can pretend they do and they're going to be fine. You know? So, <laughs> uh, you know, you can kind of make that one up uh, as you go. Uh, there are two parts of the uh, Form ADV. One part of the Form ADV is part one. And the other part of the uh, ADV is uh, part two. Uh, which one of those serves as a brochure? Uh, part, part two. Right on. Uh, I call on you. I say, hey, Dr. Hoskins, uh, Dean Tenney here, investment advisor representative. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to you the investment advisory uh, brochure for ADV part two, but I do want to get busy managing your money. And I know that you probably want to have your attorneys look over the uh, investment advisory contract, things like that. But hey, let's go ahead and get started right now. In, in that situation, uh, how long does the customer have to say, you know, I looked this over and I've uh, changed my mind uh, without penalty. Um, I, I feel like it's a a, a week. Well, week? Forty eight. You're close. Remember, I asked you forty eight hours. 48 hours yeah, okay. Right within forty eight hours, and then it says before entering the contract. So be here on the forty eight. I didn't give the okay. brochure to you forty eight hours in advance. So I say, Doctor Hoskins, I didn't give this to you. I'm giving it to you now. So now you have five days to rescind without penalty. Now, if I had given it to you three days before I arrived, the assumption is you could have had time to look it over. And if you had any issues, you'd be addressing them now. So if I don't deliver the brochure to you 48 hours before I arrive or before we consummate business, then you have five days to uh, rescind that. All right. So doo -doo -doo -doo, let's see what else here. Um, don't get, uh, how are you feeling about the math? You feeling okay about the math? Um, no, actually, that's something that I did not go okay, so over at all. I would tell you that most of the, the, the math is going to be recognition. It's not going to be, can you actually do it? You know, but do you recognize input right. and output? So for example, if I actually calculate a future value, I'm not going to ask you to do it. I'd say, but what would you need to figure out the future value of something? You need to know the current amount of money we have today. Yeah. The expected rate of return we're going to get. And then how long we have to get there, right? So those are would be our input. How much might say, John, how much money do you have today? He's okay. Gonna, yeah, that's Give me simple. a number. That's yeah. yeah. Now, remember, there's kind of a cocktail trick that can work too. Remember the cocktail trick? I call it a cocktail party trick called the rule of 72. Yeah. Right? So we can take any kind of a return. And sometimes you can use that to kind of trick. Now, if we're going to do present value. So future value, we said, how much do we have today? What's our expected rate of return? What's our time horizon? Pretty, you know, if you, by the way, if you sit there and think about it, when you get the question input, I just gave you three things. So, you know, like accept. Now, if I'm trying to figure out present value, right? So I have a number in the future and I'm trying to figure out what that is going to be. So if to compute the present value, I got to go, okay, how much do we need in the future? What's our expected rate of return and the time the money will invest? I'll say, okay, John, then we need today X number of dollars, right? To go to future value, we started with the present value. 
but we can go either direction. We can start with a future number we need for college education or retirement or whatever case yeah. it is and backfill it to come up with uh, today. Um, internal rate of return. Uh, I would just know that it's the rate that takes the future value to present value. That's the number. So if you get that, it'll be morally about, about, about a bond. Are you familiar with beta? Yes. So beta, remember, is a measurement of volatility as compared to the market. So the beta is one. The beta is one. The market went up 10%. Our security went up 15%. The beta was one. The market went up 10%. Our security went up 15%. So what do we call that? 5%. We were expecting 10. Oh, yeah, that's, um, I don't know, what is it? Alpha. Alpha. Yeah, yeah. So alpha is the excess return over beta, right? So if we're expecting, uh, you know, we got a beta two, we would expect the, when market goes up 10, we would get 20%. And that excess return is called uh, beta. Now, it's important in terms of diversifying your portfolio that we pay attention to a concept called correlation. Correlation. And so the one you want to be looking for tomorrow is negative correlation. Negative correlation. Negative correlation is things that move the opposite direction. And so, you know, tomorrow they say, what would provide the portfolio with the uh, most uh, correlate, our most uh, diversification? And you'd be shopping your answer set, looking for something that had negative correlation, meaning it moves the opposite direction. Positive correlation means the securities move together. They move together and then negative correlation means they move the opposite. Um, there are some fundamental analysis. So on a balance sheet, on a balance sheet, are you familiar with the working capital? Um, uh, current assets, current liabilities. Yeah, they're excellent. Current ratio. The current, no, not really. I need to go over that again. Well, that case, so, so that's current yeah. assets divided by current liabilities. Current assets divided by current liabilities. Um, there are certain uh, types of risk uh, that you should be aware of as it relates to the various investment vehicles. One investment vehicle we have is called an American depository receipt. Mm -hmm. An American depository receipt. And what kind of risk do you have in an American depository receipt? Oh, that's a... Uh... Is there an exchange rate risk associated with Yeah, you with got that? it. Exactly. Currency risk, yeah. right? We're buying that foreign security in our U.S. domestic market, mm -hmm. but it's still conducting the business in the foreign uh, currency. So we look Excellent. at that with, um, with any kind of political risk associated yeah, with it? Uh, additional political risk as well. Currency risk is the one they're looking for, but you're right. You know, the, the you okay, know so president of Mexico right now is not a capitalist-friendly guy. So, you know, yeah. so, yeah. You know they can nationalize uh, Shad, just uh, nationalize Exxon's operations in, uh, in Chad, right? So... Uh, indeed. Okay, so we have this concept called discounted cash flow. So, you know, we're looking at the future and saying, okay, what is X number of payments, income streams, income payments to me worth today? So, for example, if I buy a, a 10 year bond, I'm going to get 20 coupon payments, right? Because it's paying me semi annually. And I say, okay, so if I'm going to get these uh, 20 payments, what do I think is a fair price uh, for that bond based on that future income streams? No, I always use the uh, lottery analogy. I say, hey, John, you won the lottery. Do you want a uh, set number of payments for the future for the rest of your life or do you want a lump sum? Now, you know, okay. John, what I would suggest is before you answer, say, let me do some math. Let me do some math and figure out which one of those is uh, mathematically the better choice. And so that's what discounted cash flow is about. So I had a guy who you know, <laughs> kind of fired up on me. I said, you know, in my career, I'm not a guy who likes math. So I paid a guy who's the most brilliant mathematician I know. His name is Lee to do the math for me. And mm -hmm. I would call Lee and say, hey, Lee, should I take the lump sum or should I take the, the payments? Anyways, this guy, you shouldn't be in our business if you can't do math. I go, I didn't say I can't do math. I just said I choose not to. And there are all yeah. kinds of very successful people in our business who are math challenged. I mean, you know, so yeah. maybe yeah. it's actually the opposite. The math guys don't do, the math guys, are men, men and women typically don't do as well as uh, people who have some good people skills, perhaps. But anyways, <laughs> so in a bond, uh, we call that discounted cash flow. And what we're trying to do is uh, come up with what we think is a good value for the bond. You know, and then that, if we already buy the bond, that return is going to be the internal rate of return. Now, in stocks, we also do this same math. But when we apply discounted cash flow to stocks, 
That's point number one. It has to be a stock that has a dividend because there's stocks that don't have income streams and we can't do discounted cash flow on things that do not have income streams. So we have what's called the dividend oh. discount model. The yeah. dividend discount model is discounted cash flow as applied to a stock with a dividend. Again, I always use Mr. Buffett. You know, Mr. Buffett says, okay, I'm going to get these future dividend payments. What do I think that's worth today, right? And if he comes up with a price that makes sense, he says, okay, I'm going to do that. Now, there are the opportunity to say, okay, well, maybe those dividends will grow. You know, for example, uh, Berkshire Hathaway has a billion-dollar position in Bank of America, 700 million shares they got directly from Bank of America, 300 million shares that Mr. Buffett bought in the secondary market. But if he thinks, okay, I'm getting 18 cents a quarter, but they're going to perhaps grow the dividend and increase it, which they did to 21 cents, that's called the dividend growth model. So the good dividend growth model gives us a higher valuation number because we're factoring in that this income stream we're getting may grow. Now, test question, we can't apply dividend growth model to a preferred stock, for example, because in a preferred stock, that is not going to grow. That preferred stock dividend is fixed or uh, stated. All right, so we're talking about just a uh, flying high. Uh, can you do current yield? Do you know how to do current yield? Um, so if yeah. you can't remember what to do tomorrow, John, divide. And if you can't yeah, remember what to divide, divide, take the first number and divide it by the second number. That takes care of a lot of the math. And remember that the math, uh, one of the numbers is correct. Right? So, you know, sometimes you can fumble around. But current yield is what an investment pays you by what it costs you. What it pays you by what it costs you. So in a stock, that would be the annual dividend divided by the market price. In a bond, that would be the annual interest divided by that current market price. Uh, I would be able to uh, do that uh, uh, current current yield. Okay. Okay, so mutual funds. Uh, what is the uh, difference between an open-end mutual fund and a closed-end mutual fund? Uh, one trades freely in the market. The one is a uh, continuous. Um... Love it. Perfect. You're perfect. If it is an open-end fund and we're continually offering new shares to the public, we have what are called A shares. And A shares have an upfront sales load. Okay, yeah. And that sales load can be no more than um, eight and a half. And that's the eight and a half. Gotcha. Yeah, eight and a half, eight and a half. Yeah. And the answer set would have gave me the right amount. Like no, no, I'm telling you, like I told you, like, you're going to have answer sets tomorrow. So I'm just going to you pull them out of the stratosphere. So I get that. Okay, yeah. so if we're going to sell you an a, a share, we're typically going to have breakpoints. And so we have breakpoints and we have breakpoint sales. Breakpoints are good. Mm -hmm. Breakpoints are a quantity discount. They say, John, if you invest X number of dollars, I'll just make up one. If you invest $100,000 or more, you're going to pay a 3% load. And if you invest uh, less than 100, you're going to pay a 4% load. That's a breakpoint. Varies from fund to fund is stipulating the perspectives. I just made that one up. Mm -hmm. You say, well, Dina, unfortunately, I don't have $100,000. I say, well, John, do you think that over the next 13 months, you might be able to come up with an additional $20,000? Because if so, we should fill out a letter of intent. Good for 13 months, can be backdated 90 days. Uh, on that uh, break point, in my example, I told you there's a break point in 100. And so you say, Dean, how much should I invest? I say, you want to invest $99,999. You say, why? I say, because I'll make a $4,000 commission. Then you give me another buck, I'm only going to make a $3,000 commission. Mm -hmm. Am I A, a full service broker, or B, violating the code of conduct of FINRA, more importantly, the ethical requirements of the North American Security Administrator Associations? I'm violating that ethical code, right? So a breakpoint sale is a no-no. So be careful, read RTFQ. Breakpoints are good, quantity discounts. Breakpoint sales are bad. Now, some funds have a promotional expense. You know, this is an expense they charge the fund to run, you know, advertising on TV and do marketing in the newspapers, to pay brokers. And uh, some uh, 12B1 fees you can charge and still hold yourself out to the public as a no-load fund. And that's one quarter of 1%. 
So I can charge up to one quarter, 1% as a 12B1 fee and still say I'm a no load fund. But if I go past that, then I can't refer to myself as a no load fund. And in no circumstance can I go past what three quarters of 1% and no circumstance can I go under uh, over that. Um, we have a federally covered securities and the federally covered securities we have that we don't have to register with the state are New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, mutual funds, and private placements under Reg D. You know, Reg D is one of those ones that's exempt from registration with the SEC, as well as the state administrator. And we organize a lot of investments as uh, private placements, private partnerships, and to participate in a private placement or a private partnership, a hedge fund, a venture capital fund, a private equity fund, or any other private placement, real estate, winery, whatever. What kind of investor? We can have institutional investors, but uh, what does the retail investor have to uh, meet to be involved in that? Accredited. That's right. And what is the accreditation standard? Oh, that's a good question. Um, is it over a million? A million net worth, worth, exclusive of your primary residence. And um, and the annual or income, is it 250K annual? 200. So a good way to remember it is one, two, three. One, two, okay. three. Million dollars net worth, exclusive primary resident, or two hundred grand for the last two years, with the expectation of grant that this year, or three hundred married and filing jointly for the last. Okay. So that's one, two, three. That's a good way to remember that. Uh, let's see. Uh, do mutual funds do mutual funds and REITs pass through both their income and their losses? No. Right on. They just pass pass through income. How much must they pass through? 90%. Excellent. 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 Uh, we have uh, variable annuities. And variable annuities are mutual funds with insurance wrappers. And so we are typically funding a variable annuity with money we've already paid taxes on. So that's going to be your cost basis. If you give me a hundred grand to put in a variable annuity, boom, you know, that's going to be your cost basis. And then it's going to grow tax deferred. Now, tomorrow, we have a type of annuity you get tested on that isn't a variable annuity. It's a type of fixed annuity called an equity index annuity. Yeah. And the reason it's not considered a security is because you can never lose any money at it. I say, John, the insurance company is going to credit you for whatever the market did. Yeah. The market went up 20%. We're going to credit your account for 20% or whatever the participation rate is. But if the market goes down, there's going to be no negative reset. Now, what I mean by no negative reset from the point to point tomorrow on your exam is you should never tell me if you get a question about an equity indexed annuity that goes backwards. It only goes what? Oh. Forwards. And that's why insurance agents can sell that without a securities license because that is not a security because you can't lose your principal, right? Oh, that makes, yeah, it makes more sense. It's a, yeah, it's kind of a hybrid one to be kind of, uh, you know, uh, thinking about. Uh, options uh, at this point of your test tomorrow, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, I would, yeah, that's how I felt as well. Yeah, it's just basic kind of stuff. So um, we do have partnerships. We have partnerships uh, both as potential clients of our investment advisory firm. But we also have uh, business structures that we may use to set up our investment advisory firm. And so, uh, you know, partnerships have a flow through of both income and losses. And, you know, if I say, hey, let's, uh, John, set up a partnership uh, I'll be the general partner and you can be one of the limited partners. I'm going to raise some money. I'll provide the expertise. Very testable. The general partner has unlimited loss potential. So you may get a question tomorrow, something like you have a husband and wife as customers of your investment advisory firm, and they are running the business as a general partnership. And they might have something on the test that goes something like, why would they decide to dissolve their general partnership and reorganize as an LLC? And you would say, oh, they would probably do that because of the unlimited liability they have exposure to as general partners. So one of the advantages of the LLC form is that you don't have that unlimited loss. Now, remember, this can also be not only clients of the broker dealer, but it could be an investment opportunity. And so if I'm your investment advisor representative and I'm going to put a partnership into your portfolio and you're going to be a limited partner, I said, boy, this better not be money we need to be liquid. 
because you can't get in or out of a partnership without permission of the general partner, right? So very much not a liquid uh, thing. Okay, when we go to register new accounts of the investment advisory uh, clients, we can either use joint, you know, lots of different types of registration, but two that uh, you should be prepared for tomorrow is joint tenants with rights or survivorship mm -hmm. versus uh, tenants in common. Do you know how those are different? Yeah. Right. So joint tenants, decedent share, goes surviving party, tenants in common, the decedent share goes to their state or beneficiary. Now, one mm -hmm. of the funky things that's a little different about powers of attorney, whether it's a limited power of attorney or a full power of attorney, limited means we can just make investment decisions for you. Full means I can also withdraw monies and securities from your account. And there is a distinction between these uh, powers of attorney as it relates to a discretionary account at a brokerage firm versus an investment advisory firm. If it's a broker dealer, we have to have the discretionary authority prior to the first trade. But if it's an investment advisory firm, we can use oral authorization for 10 days. So that's one of those weird things that's a little different uh, between a broker dealer and an investment advisory. We'll, we'll say that again with the broker dealer one that it has broker dealer there. prior to the first trade. So, you know, before I do a discretionary trade in your account as an agent of the broker dealer, I got to have the proper documentation in place. Okay. And as, as an advisor, a, I can as an advisor, I got 10 days. Yeah. I can be doing trades with using your oral authorization to do so. A very testable, all powers of attorney cease upon death. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, we do have a durable power of attorney, but that doesn't survive your death. Durable power of attorney means if you're legally incapacitated, I still have authority to act on your behalf. So, you know, that's what durable means. Okay. Now, you might say, hey, Dean, I'm not comfortable giving you power of attorney right now, but you know, if something happens to me, I think that would be a good idea. Now, okay. I, say, well, I say, well, you know, that's, uh, John, we can make what's called a springing power of attorney. Springing power of attorney means it doesn't spring into becoming a power of attorney until some contingent future event happens like you're in an accident or something like that, then, then now my power of attorney is uh, triggered. All right, let's see. Uh, when you die, if you don't have a will, what that, what's that say? You die intestate, right? And that's the oh. legal term for not having a will. Okay. They're going to ask you about a, a balance sheet of your customer. So I say, hey, John, I want to do a really good job for you over time. I need to know uh, more about you. So, you know, what I'd like to do is go over your current assets, your long-term assets, your current liabilities, your long-term liabilities, establish your net worth. And you should be prepared tomorrow to be able to put something on a, a balance sheet or something that does not. They're going to ask you what would go on the customer's balance sheet, what would not. Like, it's got to be a number is the way you think about it, right? We can't, well, I, I'll be a jerk. It should be a number, but not like your age. Right. A, a number that is a, you know, a, a finance number, uh, like, and, and it's stupid, but testable, John, when doing the personal balance sheet, they got some wacky questions like, you know, this, you know, stupid, but testable. like what's a sofa. Now I wouldn't count that as one of your assets, but you know, if you get that stupid question about a sofa, you say, yeah, it's a personal property. It's an asset. Uh, as your investment professional, I certainly hope we're not counting on you know, your personal property to carry the day for you in terms of uh, things. I have to say, though, that this reminds me when I retired here to Nevada, I felt like I was in one of those picker shows because that's literally what I did. I opened up my place in San Francisco, my mom plays, everything's for sale. I feel like yeah. a, we literally that the sofa. What are you getting me for the sofa? 200 bucks? <laughs> <laughs> I had a watch. And liquidation <laughs> prices right there. So, but anyways, that does show up in terms of, uh, in terms of that. Um, I say, hey, John, you know what I want you to do here too is to discuss uh, what happens to your financial uh, uh, covenants you have with your family and stuff you're not here to provide. And so what we need to do is some needs analysis, need analysis to see how much life insurance you're going to need. So they might ask you a question about what do we use to determine uh, how much life insurance the customer needs? And it's called needs analysis. Be careful. Sometimes on the trick, answer is that you're trying to figure out how much insurance you can sell the guy. No. <laughs> so, you know, we want to make sure we're following our fiduciary responsibility. Yeah. Um, you're definitely going to get, I don't know what kind of draw you're going to get tomorrow. I'm wishing for you a dream draw, but you're definitely going to get tested on the efficient market hypothesis. 
Okay. And there's three forms of that. I always start with the strong form first. And what I think about the strong form is nothing works. Nothing works. Okay. Then we can back off from the strong form and say, okay, well, what does semi-strong mean? Well, that means a material on public information would work. You know, weak mm -hmm. form means everything could work. So there's going to be three forms. Uh, weak form says technical analysis doesn't work. Semi-strong says neither or a technical uh, works. Technical or fundamental, as I just mentioned, inside information is what they want on the test. And strong means nothing works. And that doesn't mean we don't make a recommendation to you. That just means that maybe we get an index fund for you, right? You mm -hmm. know, that sometimes they give you, sorry, and they're like, John, I don't really think active management is worth it. It's expensive. I don't think it delivers any alpha to me. I'm willing to accept a market-based return. And you say, oh, Dean, sounds like you believe in the efficient market hypothesis. Okay. So let's get you an index fund. Let's get you an index fund. Okay. Um, let's see. So I think that's pretty good overview for our 30 minute coaching. Let's see if there's any other big ones I want to bring up. We talked about that already. Uh, they have a question about a customer dying. Mm -hmm. why, why they want to kill people on the test, but there's a question about a grandma and the grandma, you know, gives her, uh, it doesn't have to be grandma. It's usually a relative though. So, and the relative is either alive or dead. And so what they ask you on the test is, what is the cost basis of a grandma giving her granddaughter or an aunt to her niece securities while she's a living, breathing human being walking planet earth. And you would say in that situation, the person who gets the gift assumes the donor's cost basis. Yeah. Now the other version is the aunt or niece or grandma, granddaughter, whatever has died. And uh, now the niece has inherited that security position. And the test question there is there'd be a step up in the basis. Right, and yeah. they, so they sell it. Um, dollar cost averaging, I would be prepared for dollar cost averaging, fixed dollars invested regularly. You know, so to make that work for you, I say, hey, we just finished going over your balance sheet, your income statement, John. And what I'd like to do is get, take $100 every quarter and invest it in a mutual fund. And you say, oh, that sounds, what's that? I said, that's called dollar cost averaging. It, it ends up we're doing exactly what we should be doing, John, which is buying more when they're uh, low and less when they're high. Test question number two, you'll end up with a lower average cost basis than those are, which is a lower average cost than those are the underlying shares. Doesn't guarantee a profit. Now, that might be something you have to do in terms of a simple average. What I mean by that is add up the prices, you know, 5, 10, 5, 10, and you add that up, divide by four, and then you add up the number of shares and you figure out what that uh, that's going to be. Uh, how much uh, in taxes against my personal tax return, can I uh, deduct from investment losses? Uh, 3K annually. Yeah, good job, good job. If I want immediate execution at the best available price, uh, what kind of order would I use? It's a, it's a stop order? No, immediate execution. I don't market, know. market order. Market order, yeah. I'm yeah, sorry. the stop I'm order would be to order. stop a loss, you know, protect a profit. Yeah. So yeah that's the right. stop order. Um, if I ask about the real rate of return tomorrow, that means deduct inflation, right? So okay. I say your client made 8%, CPI was five. What was the real rate of return? And you simply net those two numbers. So uh -huh. that is something to be prepared for. Sometimes they might refer to as constant dollars. Uh, besides common stocks, which is a hedge against inflation, there is another investment that will keep pace with inflation. Yeah. You know which one that is? Probably. Yeah. Good. You're right on tips. That's exactly right. Um, we have, uh, various indexes we use to benchmark, you know, so if I'm going to have performance-based compensation, I have, have a benchmark. So if I'm managing a small cap, uh, fund or a small cap, uh, investment advisor, what would be my benchmark if I'm managing the small caps? Oh, small cap Russell? Was it Russell? Right on. Good job. Russell 2000. I'm, uh, managing, uh, international, uh, investments. Oh man, Wilshire, Wilshire. Sorry. No, the Wilshire 5000 is there, but that's the total US stock market. This one would be EFA. EFA, E A F E. Uh, Europe, Asia, Australasia. That's EFA. Okay. Yeah. Africa, EFA, E A F F E. Uh, I'm managing uh, large cap stocks, mm -hmm. the S P 500, right? So, Russell 2000, S&P 500. That's also used for beta, by the way, in that modern portfolio theory. Uh, 
Russell 2000, you brought up Wilshire 5000. The other one I'd be aware of is Dow Jones Industrial Average. And that is uh, price weighted. It's the only one that is price rated. So, all right. Well, I think your 30 minute coaching call, I feel pretty good. I think we poked that around in your brain housing group. Uh, I felt pretty good. I didn't find any uh, very empty holes there in terms of what you know. Yeah. So I'll be with you in spirit yeah. tomorrow. Let me know what happens. Uh, sure. Email or whatever. Uh, if you, again, Epicratico, the first do no harm, but if something pops up and you need me, just, you know, send out the bat signal and, you know, I'll uh, give it to you. But it sounds like you're in pretty good shape. Anything else you want to ask me? Oh uh, yeah. I feel pretty confident about it. Thanks for your time. I yeah. Think, you uh, feel, yeah. Yeah. You yeah. sound good. And to be honest with you, even if you weren't sounding good, confidence is key. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, I mean, be I confident in your somebody... answers. And, because, ago, yeah. and it was easier than I anticipated. It was well, well, we haven't, yeah, you're going to go down there tomorrow. So but uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, be, I always tell people, be confident in yourself. And most important, be confident in your answers tomorrow. Did you, who was your test prep vendor? Um, Pass Perfect. Oh, yeah. So Pass Perfect yeah. is tougher than the exam. So I joke oh, the yeah. good news about that is they probably stretch your mind and now it doesn't come back. And so I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. It's better to be pleasantly surprised on this thing than it is to be unpleasantly surprised. Yeah, uh, what were absolutely. you scoring on their practice tests? I am mid seventies, high seventies. Oh, perfect, 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 perfect. Okay, even the ones I underperform on, I'm still getting over seventy five questions the, correct. On that's overall. that's what you need. So I always tell people, you're in the seventy range. I'm not worried about you. You know, below seventy, there's a you know there could be a glitch in the universe. You still should be able to pass, but seventy is right where you need to be. So, okay, I will let you go. I'll be expecting good news. If you get around to it, pop in Tuesday on the live stream. Tell us you're a victorious test taker. Yeah, absolutely. Always good for morale. I'll be there. We'll okay. see. Okay. You. you know where to find me if you need me. Yes, sir. Okay. Bye bye. Yep. Yeah.